Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here. Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I want to read to you a little something. The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are unchangeable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mind of wealth, a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given you in life, will be opened in the judgment, and will be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, rewards the greatest labor, and condemns all who trifle with its holy contents. Author Unknown. I remember first seeing this in a Gideon's Bible in a hotel. Gideon's used to uh, print King James, well, or have printed King James Bibles for them with this as an introduction. I've heard the Gideons no longer use the King James. I think it's the new King James they use. But uh, a lot of hotels do not have the Gideon's Bible anymore because people complained. Oh, I don't want a Bible in my room. Hmm. One day they might change their mind. But... Uh, then again, the U.S. government allows Hindus from India to come to this country and then loan them money to buy hotels. And it's, I used to work for one. And the Small Business Administration gave them three quarters of a million dollars to buy a hotel. I was their manager. Yeah. I didn't last at that job too long. So, you know, there was a, a guy on the street interviewing people. And he'd go up to people and say, what do you think are the, what do you think is the biggest issue or potential problem that we're facing today in the in the nation ignorance or apathy and the guy on the street said well 
I don't know and I don't care. Ignorance. Lack of knowledge on a subject. Apathy. Not caring. You know, a lack of concern. I don't know and I don't care. If this Bible study is going to have one word, it's going to be knowledge or lack thereof. The Bible is a book of health, agriculture, science, oh yeah, science, law, economics, Hmm, very interesting, right? The Bible is a complete source of government. Complete, total. Law and economics. So, let's take a look. What does the Bible say about knowledge. Well, what is called the, what some people call the law of first mention in the Bible, you know, if you take a word and do a search on it, find out the first time the word appears in the Bible, and then read the context, it'll usually give you a very good idea. Even if you don't know what the word means, It'll give you a very good idea of how that word, what its meaning is in relation to the, the text and the context. So, what, when's the first time the word knowledge appears? Well, Well, knowledge can be found the first time in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis, the beginning, right? So let's take a look at Genesis 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man. And by the way, man is a racial description, believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah. When, uh, yeah, it is has reference to uh, take a look at Revelation chapter 1 where it talks about what Jesus looks like that kind of description yeah and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree, every tree that is pleasant to the sight, a tree that's pleasant to the sight, and good for food. The tree of life also is, uh, the tree of life all also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, what's interesting about the Bible is sometimes... When the Bible is talking about trees, um, they're talking about something you get food from. You know, like dates. I mean, I'm not talking about going out with a girl or a guy or whatever. You know, figs, fig trees, date tr palms, you know, fruit trees, right? 
But sometimes trees can refer to family trees. So you've got the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you want proof of that, go to Ezekiel 31. Eh, we'll skip around a little bit. Ezekiel 31, 1. And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the third month, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude. Whom art thou like in thy greatness? Behold, the Assyrian, uh, Syria was a part of the Assyrian Empire. Matter of fact, uh, Jonah, you know, Jonah and the, the great fish, the whale, he was sent to Nineveh, which was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Verse 3, Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon. Now, were the Assyrians trees, talking trees that were sinning, and the Lord sent Jonah there to tell them to repent and turn from their evil ways, or I'm going to destroy your city? Uh, no, it's a figure of speech, people. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches, and with a shadowing shroud, and of a high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. The waters made him great. The deep set him up on high with her rivers running round about his plants and sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Hmm. Let's skip down to verse 7. Thus was he fair in his greatness, fair, in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. Listen to this, verse 8. The cedars in the garden of God, the cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. Verse 9. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden, all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God, envied him. Now, if you could explain to me how trees have envy, emotions, uh, and show me from the Bible, I'd be very interested. Now, this is talking about family trees. Figures of speech talking about family trees. So that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Oh, yeah. So you got a tree of good and evil. The tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? What does uh, Webster's 1828 dictionary say about knowledge? And then we're going to get going. I'm, I'm laying the foundation for the Bible study. Knowledge, noun. A clear and certain perception of that which exists or of truth and fact. The perception of the connection and agreement or disagreement and repugnancy of our ideas. We can have no knowledge of that which does not exist. God has a perfect knowledge of all his works. Human knowledge is very limited and is mostly gained by observation and experience. Oh, and by the way, that's what science is. Observation and experience. 
You know, that's why evolution is not science. There, nobody's experienced a rock turning into a lizard or a bird or a lizard turning into a bird. Nobody's ever experienced that. Nobody's observed that. I mean, it has to be observable and repeatable. I mean, you know, if you say, yeah, well, you know, if you uh, take a match to gasoline, it's going to burn or explode. You know, take some gasoline, throw a match. Oh, it burns. Okay, let's try it again. You know, you do it 10 times and it does it every single time. You say, well, yep, that's science. Gasoline will burn if you put a, a match to it. A lit match, by the way. That's experience and observation. And it's repeatable. All right, second... Uh, Second usage of knowledge. Learning. Illumination of mind. Ignorance is the curse of God. Boy, that's that's that ties right into what I'm getting ready to teach here. Ignorance is the curse of God. Knowledge, the wing wherewith we fly to heaven. Number three, skill. As a knowledge of seamanship. You know, back back in the old days, uh, you know, a sailor had to have knowledge of a ship. Navigator, captain, you know, how to tie knots, how to rig your sails, to use the wind. Number four, acquaintance of any fact or person. For example, I have no knowledge of that man or of that thing. Cognizance or notice, you know, recognizing. Uh, and he even uses Ruth, the book of Ruth, chapter 2, verse 10. When, um, oh, I forget his name. Boaz, I think. Yeah, Boaz. Uh, acknowledge Ruth. Saw how poor she was and told his servants to uh, not pick all the everything from the field, leave stuff on the, the edges, which is what we're supposed to do. On the corners of the fields and stuff, we're supposed to leave food for the poor. Do you know in India, from what I've read, Two, between two and three thousand people a day die of starvation in India. And yet they export food. Yeah, they sell food and they let their people starve. A guy I worked with was a missionary to India. And he says, I've never seen such a cursed place in all my life. He spent time there evangelizing. And I says, how many people did you win to Christ? And he says, to the best of my knowledge, none. Zero. He says, that place is cursed. Uh, you ever heard of Hare Krishna? India. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Number six, information, power of knowing. Uh, knowledge, number seven, can mean sexual intercourse. Uh, he had knowledge of that woman. Uh, but it is usual to prefix carnal as carnal knowledge. Knowledge, to acknowledge or avow, is not used. So, that's the Webster 1828 dictionary definition. And by the way, Webster was a believer 
And Webster knew the biblical languages of Hebrew and Greek. I mean, the guy knew like 20 different languages. 20, I think it's, I think 22 languages. I mean, how would you like to be able to go any country in Europe and be able to speak? I mean, Europeans consider themselves illiterate if they only know one language. Most Europeans know a minimum of two or three languages fairly fluently. You know, us Americans, eh, never mind. All right, so turn your Bible, your King James Bible, to chapter 4 of the book of Hosea. I did a Bible study on Hosea. Hosea is a wonderful book. Absolutely wonderful book. It's God's love story to Israel. Believe it or not, it's a love story. But people don't want to read. Hey, the football game's on. The ball game. My dad wanted me to be a baseball player. My dad was actually drafted by the minor leagues of in the baseball but then the japanese decided to bomb pearl harbor and that was kind of the end of his baseball career so uh yeah and he had a injury in the service uh shoulder injury that kind of prevented him from playing ball because he used to try to play ball with me to get me interested. And his shoulder would give out after, I don't know, a little bit of time. I don't remember. I was pretty young. But I was never really interested in baseball. Baseball used to be called America's Game back in the 40s, 50s, I guess the 60s. I liked football, but... When I got to uh, junior high and high school, the kids were twice the size of me. I think I was 118 pounds when I went into high school. Yeah. Soaking wet. Yeah, if I stood out in the rain and had all my clothes soaking wet, I was about 118 pounds, maybe 120. Wore a 29 waist. I remember that. No, I wasn't interested in sports. So let's read Hosea chapter 4. Verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. Controversy. God's got a complaint. Com the complaint department. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge, nor knowledge of God in the land. So there's no truth. Sounds like uh, election time with all the politicians, don't it? There's no mercy. And there's no knowledge of God in the land. Doesn't sound much different than uh, anywhere in the Europe or in the United States. Verse 2. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, yea, the fishes of the sea shall also shall be taken away. Yet let no man strive nor reprove another, for thy people 
are as they that strive with the priest. In other words, if you had a godly priest, the people would uh, fight him and, and argue with him. Verse 5, Therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. Verse 6, listen to this carefully. Here's the punchline of this whole Bible study. My people are destroyed. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Yeah. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of God, I will also forget thy children. See, it was the priest's job to teach the law. And they had forgotten the law of God. And God says, well, you've rejected me. I'm going to reject you. I will also forget thy children. As they were increased, who? Israel, their numbers. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. Sounds like today's headlines, if you ask me. They eat up the sin of my people, and they set their heart on their iniquity. So, are their hearts seeking after God, or are their hearts seeking after sin? Things that God hates. Verse 9, And there shall be like people, like priests, you know, you ever heard the saying, like, like mother, like daughter? Yeah. And there shall be like people, like priest. And I will punish them for their ways and reward them their doings. Yeah, he's going to punish them and give them the reward that they deserve. Which they're not going to like that reward. For they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom and shall not increase because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. Yeah, they want to get drunk and play around with harlots. My people ask counsel at their stocks and their staff declareth unto them for the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err. Now, what do you mean stocks? Uh, it's, it's like their idols. They ask counsel of their idols and their staff declareth declareth unto them, for the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err. Error is, E-R-R -R is where they get the word error, wrong. And they have gone a-whoring from under their God. They sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains and burn incense upon the hills under oaks and poplars and elms, because the shadow thereof is good. Therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom, and your spouses shall commit adultery. They're doing sacrifices on the tops of mountains and doing these under the trees, but they're not sacrificing to the Lord. They're sacrificing to devils. Verse 14, And I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom, nor your spouses when they commit adultery. 
for themselves are separated with whores and they sacrifice with harlots. Harlot is just a fancy old English word for whore. Therefore, the people that doth not understand shall fall. See, they don't understand the ways of the Lord. They want to eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 15. Though thou, Israel, play the harlot, yet let not Judah offend. See, you had northern Israel and southern Judah. Two houses, two different land areas, two different people, two different sets of kings. They even fought wars against each other. But your demon nominational preacher won't tell you all this stuff. Oh, Israel and Judah is the same thing. They're all Jews. Yeah, only in their mind. Though thou Israel play the harlot, yet let not Judah offend. And come not ye unto Gilgal, neither go ye up to Beth Haven, nor swear the Lord liveth. For Israel, now remember, in Jeremiah 3, 8, God divorced Israel. Jeremiah 31, 31, God promised he would make a new, new covenant with the house of Judah and with the house of Israel. But Israel was divorced, but not Judah. And if you read the first couple chapters of Hosea, Hosea confirms Jeremiah 31, 31. Verse 16. Well, 15. Though thou, Israel, play the harlot, yet let not Judah offend, and come not ye unto Gilgal, neither go ye up to Beth Haven, nor swear, the Lord liveth. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. Backsliding. You know, it's like you're trying to climb up a muddy mountain and you're trying to go up, but instead you're going down. You're going down, dog. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. Ephraim, now who was Ephraim? Ephraim was the major tribe in northern Israel. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Let, leave him be. Leave him alone. Leave him be. Their drink is sour. They have committed whoredom continually. Her rulers with shame do love. Give ye. The wind hath bound her up in her wings. They shall be of shame because of their sacrifices. Hosea 4.6 My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Oh yeah. Applicable back then, just as applicable today. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Boy, that is some harsh words. There is virtually no knowledge in this land. Virtually none. Remember we were talking about the tree of good uh, knowledge of good and evil? Well, in Genesis 2.17, God speaking to Adam, he said, But of the tree, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, 
Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And of course, Adam lived like 900 and something years, and idiots will say, well, God said that, that when Adam ate of the tree, and that day he ate of it, he's going to die. Well, he lived, you know, hundreds of years later. Uh, yeah, but he died. So what does it mean? Uh, did, uh, you know, in the day he eats thereof, he'll he'll die. Well, uh, is that talking from human perspective? Or when the Lord said he would, you know, the, the day he ate thereof, he would die. Or is that from God's perspective? Well, let's take a look. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant. Don't lack knowledge. Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Adam lived, I think, 930 years or something like that. I forget the exact number, but it was hundreds of years. Less than a thousand years in Adam's time span. But a day in the time span of the Lord. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Yeah, they'll never, the people that say, uh, that tell you that, well, Adam did, ate, ate of the fruit and he, he lived hundreds of years. So, you know, the Bible's full of it. No, they're ignorant. They lack knowledge. Now, there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is knowing facts. Wisdom is putting it to good use. What are you talking about, Bob? Well, I'll give you a quick example. Knowledge is knowing when a stove is turned on, it's hot. Wisdom is knowing to stay the heck away because you'll get burned. I remember when my oldest daughter was, I don't know, maybe one and a half, two, maybe three, eh, probably about a year and a half, two years. She loved hanging out in the kitchen with uh, me and mom. And she kept playing around the stove and we tell her, stay away from the stove, stay away from the stove. You know, you don't want to bang into the pot with the boiling water and have that fall on you, you know. So she wouldn't listen and maybe she was older i don't remember long time ago so i grabbed her around the waist and i pinned her left arm so she couldn't move it and then i grabbed her right hand with my right hand and i picked her up and I had already turned the stove up high, one of the burners. And then I took our hands, I'm holding her by the wrist, her right hand, and I put it over the burner, probably, you know, foot a foot above. And being I was much stronger than her, she couldn't break free. And I held it there until it was extremely uncomfortable for me and her because i felt the heat and so did she and she's trying to pull her hand away and i'm holding it there until i couldn't stand the heat anymore either and then i backed up and we got away and i put her down and from that point on she never went near the stove again as a child so she got knowledge and wisdom in that little instance. Yeah, the stove is hot. Stay away. 
Stove is hot as knowledge and staying away is wisdom, right? Uh, maybe that's why she doesn't talk to me anymore. I don't know. Yeah. All right, let's go to Exodus chapter 31. Now Israel had, was with Moses and they left Egypt. And the Lord's getting ready to have them build his tabernacle. Exodus 31.1 And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God. I have filled him with the Spirit of God. So here it is, the Lord is speaking to Moses, he's telling him that he's taken Bezalel and he'd filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge. Oh, okay, wisdom and knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works to work in gold and in silver and in brass. He's going to make the things for the tabernacle. And God filled him with the Spirit, his Spirit, in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. This guy's full of the Holy, the Holy Ghost. And he's going to build things for the Lord. See, when the Lord picks you to do something, he equips you. He will definitely do that. So, to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass, and in cutting of stones to set them, and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. And I behold, I have given with him a holy ab, the son of something like that boy i'll tell you what i'm gonna to have to probably apologize to a whole bunch of people for uh mispronouncing their names but yeah so this guy is of the tribe of dan and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted i have put wisdom that they may make all that i have commanded thee the tabernacle of the congregation and the ark and the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat that that is thereupon and all the furniture of the tabernacle and the table and his furniture and the pure candlestick and all his furniture and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offerings with all his furniture and the labor in his foot and the cloths of service and the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office and the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place according to all that I have commanded thee shall they do. You see, the Lord gave them his spirit to be able to do these things. So, there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Well, here's an interesting uh, study. Numbers 24, verse 12. You had uh, Balaam, who was actually a prophet of the Lord. And he actually betrayed the Lord and taught the Lord's enemies how to lead Israel into sin so that God would get mad at them and do bad things. And you can read about him in the book of, I think it's the book of Jude. All right. Uh, Numbers 24, 12. And Balaam said unto Balak. Now, Balak was the servant of the king that was trying to destroy Israel. And Balaam said unto Balak, Spake I not also to thy messengers 
which thou sentest unto me, saying, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of mine own mind. But what the Lord saith, that will I speak. And now, behold, I go unto my people. Come therefore, and I will advertise thee what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. So in the last days, I'm going to tell you what his, our people Israel are going to do to your people, you know, the enemies of the Lord, in the last days, latter days. Verse 15, And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, hath uh, said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, he hath said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. Now he's having a vision. Verse 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. Now, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. They're synonymous. There shall come a star out of Jacob and a scepter. What's a scepter? It was like a miniature staff. The uh, kings used to have it. It would have his seal on it. And when he'd send a messenger, he'd, with a message, he'd put, he'd hit, put his scepter seal on uh, whatever, like something like paper, to show that it was the official decree of the king. The scepter was a rulership. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy and destroy all the children of Sheph. And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies. And Israel shall do valiantly. Moab and Edom and Seir, well, Seir is where Edom lived, the area, Esau, Edom. God's going to let Israel wipe them out. 19. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. And when he looked on Amalek, who was Amalek? Amalek was a grandson of Esau, Edom. And if you don't know who Esau is, he was Jacob Israel's brother. They were twins. I don't know if they were identical twins, but, you know, they were born together. And if you read Obadiah, God said he hated Esau. And I think if uh, it's either Romans or Hebrews. I think it's, oh, I forget which one. God said he repeats it. I, I hated Esau. Of course, Esau hated God. But Amalek is his grandson. He married into the satanic seed line. Esau did. Twice. Twice. Maybe three times. He married two Hittite women, which were Canaanites. And then he married a daughter of Ishmael. Who did Ishmael marry? I don't know. Maybe he married a Canaanite too. He might have possibly married three Canaanites. And people tell me, oh, Chaplain Bob, you believe in that serpent seed stuff? Uh, yeah. Yeah, read Read Genesis chapter 6 and tell me how believing men can marry unbelieving women 
and have giants for children. And then later on, after the flood, you find out that uh, these giants have six fingers and six toes. Believing men marrying unbelieving women do not have giants for children with six fingers and six toes. And then God says, kill them all. It doesn't make sense. Read Job 38. It'll tell you who the sons of God are. They're angels. They shouted for joy at the creation of the earth, the foundation of the earth. Adam didn't come until six days after the creation of the earth. Therefore, the sons of God in Genesis 6 cannot be Adam's sons. Impossibility. Yes, I believe in serpent seed. And so will everybody else very, very soon. Because they're getting ready to wipe us off the face of the earth. And I honestly think God's going to let them for the most part. Nineteen, out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion. Who is this? Christ. And shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. And when he looked on Amalek, Esau's grandson, he took up this parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations. But his latter end shall be that he perish forever. Perish forever? But Chaplain Bob, uh, God loves everybody and, and God wants all of us to be saved in Jesus. But his letter end shall be that he perish forever. And he looked on the Kenites and took up his parable and said, Strong is thy dwelling place, and thou puttest thy nest in a rock. Nevertheless, the Kenites shall be wasted until Asher shall carry thee away captive. Asher was one of the twelve tribes. And he took up this, his parable and said, Alas, who shall live when God doeth this? Wow. Pretty harsh stuff, huh? Oh, yeah. You know what? I think this is going to be the end of part one I have barely I'm not even out of the first five books of the well yeah I'm barely at the five first five books of the Bible I haven't even touched the New Testament yet you know doctrine is important people it really is I mean, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses say, well, you know, Jesus, he's, he's an angel. Is Jesus an angel? A created being? That's what they'll tell you. If you listen to the Mormons, they'll tell you that he's uh, Satan's brother. Do you realize the Mormons have Satan's brother as their savior? Really? Really? I mean, generally, they're, most of them are, seem to be moral people. But is, really, is Jesus Satan's brother? I don't think so. Uh, and you know what? They would rather believe their denomination than what's in the Bible. And yes, the, the Mormons will say, well, yo, we we have the King James Bible and, and 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 we use it. But what they don't tell you is, is that, well, yeah, we have it, but we don't believe it because we say it's full of errors. And that's why Moron I, the angel, 
came down from heaven with the golden plates to give us the Book of Morons. I mean Mormons. Because the Bible was all messed up. You see, their God was unable to preserve his words in written form. Yeah. That's what they'll tell you. Well, you know, God tried to preserve the Bible, but he couldn't do it because Satan was stronger than him. So, had to bring down a golden plates from Moron I, the angel. Well, they call him Moron, Mor Moroni, but it's spelled M-O-R-O-N, I. Yeah. Moroni, Moron I. Yep, doctrine's important, people. Absolutely. All right, this is the end of part one. Chaplain Bob signing off. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.